Uh, well, thanks, Dan, for having me. And I, and I should say, I mean, Dan gives me a hard time, and I give him a hard time. But I really think, you know, in this day and age of alternative facts and attacks on like legitimate truth, uh, Dan is really uh, an example of good research and good thinking. And he's overall a good guy, just misdirected in ways that I'll point out. Um, so, um, so we're going to talk about evidence today. Uh, we're going to talk about the literature, and we're going to talk about. Um, deficits in logic and where uh, people misinterpret uh, um, uh, the data and where policy guidelines and recommendation statements that are based on faulty evidence can lead us astray. So I have uh, no conflicts uh, to disclose, much to the disappointment of Dan, who has many. And, um, and I'm a food guy. So why do I care about food and why do we care about diet, right? So we are what we eat quite literally. So what you put into your mouth becomes the substance of you. Um, and, um, you know, the choosing the right foods impacts the maintenance of general health and wellness, uh, the prevention of chronic ailments, the management of virtually every disease that you know about, and you know, helps determine how well and how long you live. So pretty important stuff, and we probably want to know what kind of foods we should be eating, what kind of foods we should be avoiding. Unfortunately, most of the research in this area is not about food at all. It's about food components or constituents. And that reductionist lens, I think, really um, causes us some trouble. And what I mean by that is that, um, you know, essentially we take this complex biology, um, these complex um, foods, and we reduce them down into like simple math or simple accounting. So we use like an accountant's ledger and a balance sheet of supposed assets and supposed liabilities. So there's supposedly good stuff, right? Like vitamins and minerals, and fiber and protein, and then supposedly bad stuff like sodium and saturated fat and sugar and all that kind of stuff, right? And so these domains, I think, are really unhelpful um, and they lead to myth. And so I call, what I'm calling myth is just concepts poorly supported or even contradicted by the evidence. And we're gonna go through a bunch today. So they can be in uh, uh, in either of these uh, in any of these four domains. So micronutrients, so those are about vitamins and minerals. Uh, macronutrients, those are about the energy supplying components of your diet. So carbohydrates, fats, and proteins. Uh, there are non-nutrients. Um, those are things that are uh, like fiber, right? So it's not essential for body growth or maintenance, but important for health probably nonetheless. Uh, and then food energy. So the the um, power that's stored up in food that allows us to do work, uh, which in this country is measured in calories or kilocalories. So this uh, is going to serve as a sort of an agenda or a guide for the rest of the talk. So we're going to talk about a micronutrient myth, sodium. We're going to talk about macronutrient fat or specifically saturated fat. And we're going to talk about calories. All right. So let's start at the very beginning. Sodium. So when I say sodium, what do you think about immediately in terms of health, health outcomes, health effects? Hypertension, you're the meds, you know it, Ian. <laughs> hypertension, right? Anything else? And hypertension leads to what? Anyone besides the med student? Well, cardiovascular disease, who's that? Great, yeah, say it loud. I'm proud. Good. All right, so sodium. So people think about blood pressure and they think about uh, cardiovascular disease. So these are some of uh, the med student and remain. She knows these. Does everyone else know these abbreviations? NA is sodium, right? Salt, BP. SCC, right? DPP, MMHD, right millimeters mercury, so just the way we measure CVD, NMI. Wow, you guys are great. All right, good. All right, so you guys know this. I'm going to use these abbreviations throughout the slides. I just wanted to put them up just in case you aren't as an audience. All right, great. So these are the latest um, iterations of the dietary guidelines, and you know they very clearly tell everyone that they should be reducing their sodium uh, content. Uh, irrespective of how much you're eating already, not even taking that into consideration. So that's kind of alarm bell number one, but supposedly everyone is eating too much. Um, this is from the ADA, the American uh, Diabetic, uh, Diabetes, Diabetes Association, it's the diabetes group. Um, and they likewise say people are eating too much sodium, that we should be limiting it for everyone overall, and that specifically for people with hypertension, especially people with diabetes and hypertension, we want to be reducing it even further, right? And then this, I just threw this in, I guess you guys talked about these guidelines, right? The latest blood pressure guidelines. They're talking about like reducing it even further than that, like down to 1500 milligrams. 
Um, and then there are like community, like this is a CDC grant to reduce sodium on a community level. Um, there's all kinds of activities to reduce sodium. This is from um, the Nutrition Action Health Letter, um, which is um, uh, 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 comes from the Center uh, for Science and the Public Interest, which is a community group that like focuses on nutrition. And the executive director uh, at the time called salt um, the deadliest food additive that there is, right? And the reasoning behind that was that eating too much sodium raises blood pressure. And when you have high blood pressure, you're at risk for cardiovascular issues. Yeah. Have they changed it? They thought it was that. I, I don't follow them. I was so <laughs> offended by this, I just kind of wrote them off. I get this. I agree with a lot of what you say. Eh, not so much. They're against, well, they're, they're, they're the ones that get attacked the past week. Yeah, yeah, I, I think they have some well-intended, well-meaning work, and there are some good people doing stuff, but I think a lot of what they do can have, well, a lot of what anybody can do when you make kind of global blanket statements can have unintended consequences, and we'll talk about that. Um, so I, I don't think they're bad people, I just think this is bad logic. We're going to talk about the logic right now. So this is, you know, almost a mathematical statement. In fact, it is math, but there's a problem with the math, so let's review it. So who remembers the transitive property of mathematics? Yeah, what is it? Can we tell you? Yeah, I, I do. I absolutely do. Yeah. Um, so it's like A equals B and B equals C, so A equals C. Boom. You nailed it. <laughs> this guy, gold star. Right? Yeah, A equals B and B equals C, so A equals C. Right? So the corollary to that is A, if A leads to B and B leads to C, then A leads to B leads to C or A leads to C. Right? And that's the logic that they're using here. That's the logic that all of this work around sodium reduction is based on. The fact that A, salt, right, or sodium, leads to B, blood pressure, leads to C, heart attacks and stroke, right? And so this is the logic that underlies all of the campaigns and all the initiatives and all the guidelines and recommendation statements. And so I want to talk about now what are the potential issues with this logic. And I'm going to start right here with the relationship between salt and blood pressure. All right, so if I want to look at the relationship between salt and blood pressure, an efficient way to do that is to look at meta-analyses. You guys have talked about those. What are they? Anyone? Not the med student. It's Lindsay, right? Yeah. Yes, not Lindsay. Yeah. Where you take like, similar studies and then pull them all into a massive study. Perfect. Yeah, so you pool them all and you come up with some aggregate measure, some aggregate, so it's a, it's a way of pooling a lot of data to get a single estimate of risk, right? And you can do a meta-analysis on all kinds of studies. Uh, Dan's preference and my preference would be to do them on randomized controlled trials, and that's what I'm going to talk about here. So first I should just give you, uh, I didn't update these slides, so just for context, we're going to call a normal blood pressure less than 120 over 80, and hypertension, there'll be some debate about that. Um, historically, it's been greater than 140 over 90. Recent evidence or recent uh, recommendations have called to lower that. There are also been recommendations to raise that in certain populations, but for the sake of argument, we'll just say it's 140 over 90, okay? All right, so, um, so we look at randomized control trials. It turns out there have been a number of them. So back in 1998, in fact, there were 56 randomized control trials that looked at uh, high and low sodium conditions and the effect on blood pressure in people without high blood pressure, so normal sense of people. And what they found was that if you lower people's sodium, you get a reduction in blood pressure of one millimeter of mercury and a reduction in blood pressure of less than a millimeter diastolic, right? So that's not terribly impressive, but then again, you know, why do you want to lower blood pressure in people without high blood pressure to begin with? What about in people with high blood pressure? Well, there were 58 trials in those people and reduced blood pressure about four millimeters of mercury systolic and about two diastolic. So just for context, so let's take someone with, you know, some mild high blood pressure, say 145 over 92. So on average, if we told that person to follow a low sodium diet, they might expect a blood pressure of 141 over 90, which is still high blood pressure and hasn't really moved the needle much at all and didn't accomplish a whole lot. Now, you might say, okay, well, this is old, you say 1998, I mean, that was more than, that was 20 years ago. Certainly, you know, that's based on old data, things have changed. Well, so the authors of this meta-analysis updated uh, their um, 
sampling recently and did a more comprehensive review of the 167 trials now and showed pretty much the same thing. When you lower salt reduction, you get about a 1% lowering uh, of blood pressure in people with normal tension and about 3.5 in uh, those with high blood pressure, which again is you know relatively trivial and clinically insignificant. Now the other thing is that um, the confidence intervals around these estimates, right? So how confident we are in the span of those estimates did not exclude the possibility that lowering salt intake could increase blood pressure in some people. And in fact, that's a well-demonstrated phenomenon. So we know that some people, when you lower their salt consumption, their blood pressure goes up. So it really calls into question this first link here between A and B, right? So it says that, you know, uh, lowering salt does not necessarily lower blood pressure in all people. And even if it does so on average, the effect is not necessarily that great. Now, the second arm of the chain, I'm not really going to question that much. So certainly, you know, blood pressure is an important risk factor for heart attack and stroke. And there is some debate about how aggressively we want to treat it and whether it's doing so we're actually helping people. And there's some, you know, caveats and nuance around certain populations like the elderly and those with diabetes. But for our purposes today, let's just take this as a given that lowering blood pressure is a good thing and reduces our incidence of heart attack and stroke. So what I want to focus on now is this relationship between salt intake and these outcomes that we care about. Because I heard Dan before I come in talking about disease-oriented evidence. Right, surrogate markers, intermediary endpoints. Like we don't really care about blood pressure. Blood pressure is like an asymptomatic thing that patients don't really know about. What we care about are outcomes that um, mean something to patients. So heart attacks and stroke, quality of life. So what we want to look at is this. All right, now to do that, um, I should first say that even if we reduce, you know, cut out salt or reduce the sodium, and we get a blood pressure reduction, and that has some influence on lowering our overall profile for heart attacks and stroke. Even if that's true, um, lowering salt, uh, blood pressure is not the only mechanism through which lowering salt might influence cardiovascular risk. So it turns out lowering salt intake also has these effects. So it raises adrenaline and noradrenaline. It raises uh, renin and aldosterone. It raises cholesterol and triglycerides. And those effects would tend to increase our stroke risk, right? Now, again, this is all surrogate endpoints, intermediary outcomes, disease-oriented evidence, right? But it at least, you know, describes some of the mechanisms through which this could be working. So let's look at the actual data. So again, we can look at randomized controlled trials. So eight randomized controlled trials of a diet of salt reduction versus not showed no significant effect of reducing salt on cardiovascular death, regardless of people, uh, if people had hypertension or not, right? So salt didn't seem to have really any input. There have also been cohort studies that have shown that, you know, so, so this is a common recommendation. The most recent guidelines, it's even lower than this, okay? So it's, this is 2,300. Uh, the most recent guidelines that I think you guys said you reviewed is 1,500. That's even lower. So this cohort study of over 100,000 people from 17 countries showed that the rate of heart attacks and stroke and death went up when intake was less than 3 grams per day, or at half the level, right? So less than 3 grams per day is like the risk threshold, and the recommendation is that it be, you know, uh, lower than that or even half that by the new guidelines. Whereas people that were well above the recommended level, twice, three times or more, had no increased risk. Um, other cohorts have shown similarly, this time you know, it was a, a different threshold, but people that ate less than 2.6 grams of sodium today, right? So, so still in this range and with the other recommendations, had an increased risk. Whereas those that ate more than five grams per day had no increased risk. And that's in you know studies when you're controlling for you know potential confounders and using population representative samples, right? So it really gets us to question this relationship, and it really makes us think you know what are we talking about here, and is this really important? Now the other thing that matters is what we put over here in kind of the exposure column, right? Because people don't eat salt as a rule. I mean we're not deer, we're not you know licking it off a 
post in the backyard. Um, we eat salt in the context of other food, right? And so sodium is only but one nutrient in the diet that's relevant to cardiovascular effect and health. And it turns out there are others, so calcium, magnesium, fiber, and especially potassium. And in fact, 18 randomized controlled trials showed that the sodium-potassium ratio matters much more to blood pressure than sodium alone. Now, to that point, it's probably the case that um, the salt content of whole foods, the salt that occurs natively in foods, is not so much an issue. And in fact, if you were to have, you know, a seafood lunch and a seafood dinner and accompany that by, you know, two, you know, heaping salads of raw vegetables, even though your sodium intake for the day without adding any additional salt from the shaker would be well above recommended levels, two times that amount, you're probably not putting yourself in cardiovascular risk. And in fact, the dietary guidelines actually recommend that we eat um, more vegetables and more seafood. Both the, um, the scientific statement for the dietary guidelines and then the dietary guidelines themselves, um, both of them recommended eating more vegetables, eating more seafood, although both suggested we should be reducing sodium and as if that reduction is concerned were more important. And so it really makes you question the logic because of things like this. So this is, you have a Korean in the room? Yeah, the kimchi? Yeah. Yeah, so I grew up with, uh, I grew up, I went to college with uh, four Korean roommates. And so I, I don't know if this is true of you and your family and your household, but uh, in my college days, they were putting this on everything. So eating kimchi like multiple times a day. So a very popular side dish, uh, which is very high in sodium. And these are the sources of sodium in kimchi. This just happens to be homemade kimchi. There are other variations, but it's essentially just a bunch of vegetables with a lot of salt. Um, and in spite of eating that salt, in spite of eating that salt regularly, frequently, daily, Koreans aren't experiencing, you know, unusually high rates of cardiovascular disease. And in fact, they rank number one on a list of 172 countries in terms of cardiovascular health. The U.S. ranks number 66. And so it gets to the point that maybe sodium is not the relevant concern here. Maybe it's the food that accompanies the sodium. So whereas Koreans are eating, you know, fermented vegetables, in the U.S., we're eating this. Right? And so it's no question that these foods are high in sodium, but it might not be the sodium that's the relevant concern. Uh, and in fact, if you were to concoct low-sodium versions of these very items, they might even be worse. So to that point, um, so when food um, companies are engineering products for you to consume, uh, there is a basic um, holy trinity, which is salt, sugar, and fat. And Michael Moss wrote a great book about that, which I would commend to you. Um, but essentially it says like when you subtract out one, you have to compensate by adjusting one or two of the others. So if we were to subtract out the salt from any of those products on the previous slide, the way we would have to compensate to make that palatable and desirable to consumers is by increasing the fat, which we're going to talk about in a minute, or increasing the sugar, which we'll talk about now. So let's say we increase the sugar. Well, it turns out, um, you know, if you increase the sugar, um, or if you subtract out the salt, there's a, a biological need, like your body has a physiologic demand for salt that's highly, tightly regulated. And so you're going to consume a certain amount of salt. And if to get the salt you need, you have to consume a greater quantity of product, a greater quantity of product that's now higher in sugar, is that a good thing for your health? Well, let's look at sugar and the relationship to cardiovascular disease, um, stroke and, uh, hyper, stroke and um, heart attacks. So it turns out that sugar may influence um, blood pressure more than sodium. So if you just look at the straight numbers, you know, randomizing people to sugar diet versus not, um, sugar may um, have a greater impact on systolic and diastolic blood pressure in terms of millimeters of mercury. Sugar may also predispose to these bad events through other mechanisms. So not just through blood pressure, but through inflammation, clot formation, oxidation, hormone um, changes in hormone levels. 
Uh, and, you know, it may precipitate cardiovascular events by increasing platelet stickiness or blood, blood um, cell stickiness. Um, a cohort study showed that when sugar was 25% of people's calories versus just 10%, right, so still generous on both sides, um, those consuming the, uh, more sugar had almost a threefold higher risk of death due to cardiovascular disease. And so it really makes us question, you know, things like these sodium labeling laws. So this is something that CSPI is in favor of. They're in favor of food labeling in general. Um, but, you know, labeling sodium so that when you go out to a restaurant, you can see what your high sodium item is. The problem with this is that uh, it is an incentive for industry to modify or reformulate their products so they're less salty, but maybe no less healthy. So in order to not put that little salt shaker next to the menu item, what they might do is, well, we'll spread it on the short and we'll just put more sugar in it. That's not necessarily better for you. Um, it also might get people to choose items that are not necessarily healthier, like items that are not salty, but higher in sugar or fat or whatever. Um, and as a final note, I should note that this is a you know, whole food that happens to be quite high in salt. Um, and you know, at least from the longitudinal studies, we know that cheese consumption is not associated with cardiovascular disease or death uh, and may be inversely tied to diabetes in a dose response way. So the more cheese people eat, uh, the less uh, they may be affected by diabetes. So I see some confused looks, yeah, right? And so it's probably not the salt that matters. And cheese also happens to be very high in something else, which is fat or saturated fat, which is our next topic. Questions so far? If, if the evidence yeah. is so clear, why is... Well, I don't know that it's clear. clear. So, so, I, so let's go back. I mean, so, so this is cohort, right? So I mean, uh, sorry, not about the oh, cheese. Yeah, yeah. You said the Center for Science and the Public Interest is in favor of the salt label. Yes. Why would they... Good question. I don't know. If they're about science. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I've made this... I've made this case to them. <laughs> I've made this case in the public domain, which people have access to, and others have as well. There's debate about this, right? So it's all about interpreting the evidence. Um, I think it's, um, uh, I think at the very least, it doesn't suggest moving forward with salt restriction, right? So even if, if restricting, even if moving in either direction on salt is not inherently harmful, there are, um, there are unintended consequences of any move forward. One of which has nothing to do with salt, it's about reformulation, right? So irrespective of what happens to salt, if you change a product or change behavior so that now people are eating more sugar or more fat or whatever, is that better for public health? I would contend no. Yeah. Have you presented this to the National Academy of Science? Because they- Not to, no. So there's, uh, we can talk about that later. So on the recording, I'm just gonna say no. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. yeah. So you said that salty foods might, the, the salt might not be a bad, bad thing for you. Mm -hmm. And that's the food that goes along with it. Yeah. How do you know that's not the case with sugar? We don't. Okay. Um, so no, it's a good point, good. right? Right. So, but, so it, it, sugar can be part of it. Um, and it might be one of the bad actors or it might be along for the ride. And I think it's a little of both. That's a great point. Right. Um, okay. All right, so after that, so the same guidelines. Um, so, you know, you can see the little icons here. So one's a salt shaker, one's a, I think that's a sugar spoon, uh, and this is supposed to be butter, I guess. So saturated fat, right? So when I say, so, so the dietary guidelines want you to limit sodium, and they want you to limit sugar, and they want you to limit saturated fat. Um, so when I say saturated fat, not the med student, what do you guys think of? What is saturated fat related to in terms of health concerns? Anyone? Anyone concerned about heard about that? Yeah, high cholesterol. And high cholesterol matters because of? Yeah, again, cardiovascular disease, right? So it's just a de different mechanism to get to the same outcome. Exactly, right. Um, right, so we worry about saturated fat because it's related to cholesterol. So eating saturated fat absolutely raises your total cholesterol level. Um, and it absolutely also raises your levels of LDL, which is low density lipoprotein, which is the predominant vehicle through, uh, by which cholesterol gets shuttled around your body. So that is not in question. Um, I don't think anybody's really debating that. There may be some, but I think that that's a pretty 
well-established facts. What is less clear, or what, what people seem to less uh, don't appreciate as much, or there's um, less uh, understanding about, is the fact that LBL is not a single particle. It's a class of particles. And there are different subclasses of LBL based on um, their size and their density. So small, dense LBL are atherogenic. They tend to promote clot formation and um, uh, inflammation and events if they're the bad actors. Whereas large, buoyant LDL may be less of a problem and may be relatively benign. So it turns out that eating saturated fats often raises the large, buoyant, benign kind and not so much the small, dense, harmful. All right, so that's one point. The other point um, is that saturated fats are really just collections of saturated fatty acids on a glycerol backbone, right? So if you look at it uh, biochemically. Saturated fatty acids vary, um, mostly in terms of chain length, and those variations matter. So it's not that all saturated fatty acids have the same effect. Some, uh, some have different effect than others. Or, you know, to use an animal farm analogy, like some are more equal than others. Um, so the saturated fat palmitate, for instance, raises LDL, whereas sterate does not. And those are just different uh, chain lines. So they're just how long they are. Um, sterate and laurate reduce uh, total cholesterol HDL ratio, reduce that, right? Which is actually a better predictor than LDL or triglycerides, or lipid profile, or apolipoproteins, or almost any other lipid marker we have. So eating those saturated fats actually has a beneficial effect on our lipid profile. Now, again, that's a surrogate outcome measure. That's disease-oriented evidence. That's, you know, I think as Dan said, you know, he got pretty uppity and reasonably so. Who cares? Yeah, right, who cares? I agree. So what do we care about? So we care about actual events. Does anyone know who that is? Totally generational uh, reference. That's great. Okay. <laughs> That's Fred Sanford, and Fred Sanford was on a TV. You guys know what TVs are? So, <laughs> TV. so TVs were these things that we used to watch when I was a kid, and they you know, had shows on them, and this was one of them. Uh, this, this was Sanford and Son. And uh, Fred Sanford was someone who like, was often under duress and distress, and he would often think like he was having a heart attack. And so I don't know if saturated fats have anything to do with fake heart attack on TV, but um, Pretty sure they're not uh, well associated with real heart attacks in the actual world. Uh, and that, um, and 21 cohort studies following people for five to 23 years would suggest that. So saturated fat intake not linked to coronary heart disease or stroke or to total cardiovascular death. Um, there were also 49 cohorts and now 27 randomized controlled trials that looked not only at people's dietary intake, but also levels of saturated fat in the blood, and then also randomized control trials looking at diets high and low in saturated fat, including supplementation with actual fatty acids, so not just food components, and um, no link between coronary heart disease. There were also cohorts that established uh, you know, pretty much no link to diabetes or cardiovascular disease in general or all-cause mortality. And then a review of 15 randomized controlled trials show, again, you know, not linked to CV or total mortality, but there was a little bit of a signal in terms of MI, right, myocardial infarction or heart attack. So it seemed like if you could reduce your saturated fat intake, you might reduce your chance of having a heart attack, not a fatal heart attack, right, but a heart attack um, by 17%. Now, that said, uh, we should talk about caveats there. So what is the caveat? So first of all, when you reduce anything in your diet, um, it's, not, um, it's not a case where that vanishes and there's a, a vacancy left. You wind up replacing that food that you didn't eat with something else. So when you're not eating saturated fats, the question is, what are you replacing it? Right? And so that probably matters for the outcome. Certainly, if you're replacing saturated fats with lentils and beans and vegetables and nuts and seeds, you're going to see a reduction in... Um, myocardial infarction and heart attack. I have little doubt about that. However, if what you're replacing your saturated fats with is margarine or trans fatty acids, the result might not be so beneficial. And in fact, it seems to be the case that trans fats 
maybe even worse than saturated fats and tend to be in terms of increasing risk of cardiovascular deaths and um, that, uh, cardiovascular disease and death. And likewise, if what you're replacing the saturated fats with is sugar, that's probably not a good thing. So again, to the point about food marketing, manufacturing, and food items that are concocted by industry. So these are hot dogs, not so healthy. And these are low fat hot dogs. Are those healthier? So when we replace the saturated fat, what they put in instead is tapioca starch, refined sugar, corn starch, refined sugar, dextrose, another name for sugar. Is that better? I don't think so. So, refine, so when you replace saturated fat with refined carbs, your coronary heart disease goes up, according to cohort longitudinal study evidence. Now, the other point is that I'm saying replace saturated fats, but just like you know, unless you're in a randomized controlled trial where they're giving you a pill that's a saturated fatty acid supplement, people don't eat saturated fatty acids, right? They eat foods. And the main sources of uh, saturated fats in the diet are dairy products and meats. <laughs> so when we look at these foodstuffs in the diet and people's um, outcomes, so it turns out that when uh, people eat a lot of meat, there seems to be a signal and it seems to increase the risk of coronary uh, or cardiovascular disease. However, for dairy, the opposite seems to be true. So the more dairy you eat, the more protective. Um, now, you could say, well, that could be due to any number of things in the dairy, right? It could be due to the magnesium, it could be due to calcium, it could be due to other constituents. That could be true, although this study showed that full fat dairy, but not low fat dairy, was associated with improvements in an overall metabolic score. So in other words, the thing that was a probable benefit was the saturated fat itself. So the saturated fat, um, so the higher fat dairy was associated with a reduced weight circumference, lower blood pressure, better lipid profile, reduced sugar. Um, when we look at um, data around like mortality, so it turned out dairy not so associated with overall mortality, but meat, processed or not, is associated with higher total and cancer mortality. Um, so we've been talking up to this point mostly about cardiovascular disease, cardiovascular outcomes, but remember cancer is a big problem on our list of leading killers in this country too, uh, and that's something we should be concerned about. And the evidence here is that you know meat processed or not could be leading to an increase there. Now, the caveat there is that's true in most countries around the world except Asia. So in Asia, higher meat intake was inversely associated with mortality. Why might that be? So uh, it gets back to more nuance, the way people are not thinking about this. So again, it doesn't just matter, like people don't just eat saturated fats, they eat foods. They also eat foods in the context of a broader diet, right? So it's not just the isolated one thing, it's the thing in the thing that's in the other thing, right? And so there's all this nesting going on. And so in the context of a otherwise like nutritionally poor diet, or a diet of people that are you know, struggling or uh, starving or um, you know, not having access to high nutritive food, and they have an otherwise low background of saturated fat intake, because again, the predominant sources are meat and dairy, which are you know, things that are harder to come by. I mean, you know, it's kind of how we're exporting obesity, like bringing those things to developing countries. But before we did that, developing countries weren't eating a lot of meat and dairy. Um, and so it turns out that in the background of a low saturated fat diet, substituting meat for rice, refined white carbohydrate, may have some benefits in terms of lipid profile. Whereas in a high saturated fat background, like a Western diet, doing that same substitution doesn't have that benefit, right? Yeah. I didn't carry any questions. Oh, I, oh. I, well, I wanted to bring the factor of um, at least uh, my experience when talking to my parents. Um, they were raised in Asian, but moved here for uh, college and whatnot. Yeah. That um, if you could afford meat, it means that you were rich. Right. So the thing is that maybe it's not exactly. Uh, That's an excellent thing. point. It's excellent point. Like, you're rich. Thing. Yeah. And, so that's another marker, right? So what are the mechanisms through which these things work? So oftentimes, and that's a great example, 
it's a marker of socioeconomic status and you know access to thing, you know even completely removed from diet you know so it might just be social position access to medical facilities uh, clean water you know nicer housing better neighborhoods all those things matter and that's all true right i'm not getting that complexity here but that's a very valid point um but so the point is that the background diet matters the other thing is how the meat is cooked matters and this is particularly true with regard to cancer so char-grilled uh, char high-temperature cooking produces uh, heterocyclic amines uh, and um, uh, you know, other, um, uh, other intermediaries that coat the surface of the meat and are linked to cancer incidence, whereas slow cooking, low heat methods like um, you know, liquid-based methods uh, tend not to be, right? So that is a potential thing that is also relevant that's not captured. And then a final thing that's not captured is the quality of the meat itself, right? So was this meat produced on a you know confined animal feeding operation by some genetically bred cattle that is eating you know largely grain that it was never designed to eat that has been produced using you know pesticides and herbicides that get stored in its fat stores and wind up in the meat, or was it some wild animal raised on natural vegetation? So we know, at least in terms of what we can measure, like fatty acid profiles and antioxidant levels, those two are very different. And that probably matters for health outcomes too. Yeah. Also, are you saying all meat, all types of meat, or? That's an excellent question too. So what is meat? Like how do you define meat? And that's that very study to study. What is red meat? I made that argument recently, or uh, you know, I wrote a little like blog post about that, because that's often not defined either. Um, so, I mean, you know, Tuna is a red meat, but most people wouldn't consider tuna red meat in any study, right? Um, you know, pork, some people consider red meat. The pork board will tell you that the other white meat, you know, right? Like, so, like, there's all this um, variability. So, I actually uh, wrote a piece talking about that. I, I thought, I think it's uh, uh, something like, is it red, how it's bred, or something, you know, some clever guy like that. But actually, <laughs> Uh, but you can, it, it, so it actually addresses that very point. It actually starts out with a quote from Chris Rock, which is um, the one time I've quoted him in an academic. <laughs> um, but anyway, so I can find that if you're interested. Um, but anyway, so, so to this point, there's a lot of nuance here, a lot of variability. And then the other thing is that, again, saturated people don't eat isolated saturated fats. They eat foods, and foods are a mix of fats and, eat, and, and of different fatty acids. So even like the things that you know people are telling us we should be eating, like olive oil, have saturated fat in them. So this is a, a distribution of the fat, um, uh, of the types of fat in each type of food. So the red is saturated, the blue is uh, monounsaturated, the yellow is uh, polyunsaturated omega-6, and the green is polyunsaturated omega-3, I think. Uh, yes, I think I got that right. Um, and so you know all of these food sources have saturated fats in them. Olive oil, you know, nuts, peanut, right? Saturated fats. Coconut is the food on this planet with the highest saturated fat content of any food out there. A plant-based food, and yet the evidence for olive oil in nuts, I think is pretty compelling, that uh, leads to better health outcomes, better benefits, better um, uh, patient-oriented outcomes in terms of cardiovascular disease, and there's at least suggestive evidence for coconut oil too. I mean, it's not quite there, but I mean, the, the point is, I don't think it's the saturated fat. Um, and so it really, you know, makes me question these dietary guidelines, which you know say the evidence for cardiovascular disease is strong, and that we should be eating fat-free or low-fat dairy. Why? I don't know. Meats. Um, uh, we should be eating less meats, less processed meats, um, and where's the, oh, uh, there we go. So less meats, less processed meats, um, less processed poultry. Um, so certainly these considerations have a lot to do with the sodium, but then like other constituents as well, right? So, so partly this is a sodium issue, the processing. Uh, but then largely these other issues, like the fat-free, the low-fat, and the meats, so they say lean meats can be part of the diet, so certainly that is the issue. So they're saying, you know, we should be avoiding fats, we should be avoiding saturated fats. Um, and then the other issue here, in addition to fat, relates to calories, which is number three. So it's not just that those foods are lower in fat, they're also lower in calories. Question so far. I'm going through this sort of quickly. 
Good. All right, number three. Cal what's a calorie? Even the med student can answer this. They all took nutrition. All right, good. Oh, you took it. Oh, oh, great. What's a calorie? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, I think it's supposed to be like your energy needs to raise it through like some amount of water and resources. Super. Very good. Yeah, that's one of the better definitions I've ever heard when I asked that question. And I, I actually should have looked it up because I think it, it has to be at a certain sea level. I think it's at sea level. I mean, you have to start at like 15 degrees and go to 16 degrees. Right. So it's it's basically amount of energy. That's all you have to know. It's a measure of energy. In this country, we measure in cal calories, actually kilocalories. We call it calories. Other countries, they use joules. Um, so if you get like food products from overseas, you'll see that. Uh, it's just a measure of energy. And it's the amount of potential energy stored within a food product so that gets converted to uh, energy that we can use to go about our daily lives and do all the things we do um, and do you know and have all the metabolic processes and other activities happening in our body right so it's a way of defining energy okay so there's a lot of interesting calories these days including by C CSPI um, in terms of labeling calories and I've come out very strongly against this First of all, because it just doesn't work. Like that's been demonstrated over and over and over again. It doesn't influence people's awareness of calories, attention to calories, purchasing of calories, or consumption of calories. And there's some evidence that suggests it actually produces the opposite effect of what we want, which is people eating more. Okay? So that's the first problem. The second problem just has to do with the fundamental idea of, of calories themselves. So, um, these are the calorie providing constituents of the foods that we eat. These are the things that provide calories in the diet. Um, and I should make clear that a calorie from fat provides the same amount of energy as a calorie from carbohydrate or a calorie uh, from protein or a calorie from alcohol. So one, ca so one calorie of anything is equal to another calorie of anything, just like one unit of anything is equal to the same unit of the same energy. Right? Um, but that's not to say foods with the same number, you know, two different foods with the same number of calories have the same physiologic effect, same biologic effect, same effect on our body. So different foods have different effects, um, you know, related to appetite and satiety, related to energy burning and energy storage. And it's unfortunate that people really only focus on the quantitative differences in calories and caloric density. So it's absolutely true that fat is the most calorically dense um, of the food constituents, right? So fat has nine kilocalories per gram as opposed to carbohydrate, which has four, less than half of that, right? And so unfortunately what happens is that a focus on calories almost inevitably becomes a focus on fat because fat is the most calorie dense. Um, so reducing calories very often means reducing the fat or more often substituting the fat with something else, which is usually sugar or starch or some other refined carbohydrate. And so the thing about it is that higher calorie fattier foods are not necessarily bad and lower calorie, lower fat foods are not necessarily good. And we'll talk about that right now. So here's just an example. So let's take two potential snacks. So you come home from school, you get out of the class, you're starving, you're famished, you want to have something to eat. You have these two options before you. You have 100 grams of walnut, you know, a handful of walnuts or a piece of cake. So the walnuts have more than twice as many calories as the cake. And they have almost five times as much fat. Right? Um, so the cake's already much lower in calories. And you could imagine uh, that the food industry could engineer a low fat version of that cake where they substitute <laughs> out some of the fat put in more sugar and you know, make that discrepancy even more market, right? Okay, the thing is though, that whole foods like nuts, and there's a recent JAMA piece that supports this, so I know Dan probably is itching to talk about, <laughs> um, keep you, um, are filling. Like, so even though this index snack has more calories, they make it so that you're less likely to eat later and less likely to consume more calories after the fact. So they promote healthier metabolism and overall better health. Whereas refined and processed products like cake, they drive hunger and they make us want to eat more. And so when your blood sugar bottoms out and you're famished, you are searching for soda and chips and other highly sugary things to get it back up again. So it's very hard to overeat walnuts. 
a try it. It's hard to do. Like you get bored with it and you get full. <laughs> it's very easy to have a second or third piece of cake and then want chips and soda with it. Um, so don't believe me, let's look at some randomized trial evidence. Let's look at an experiment. So this was in children. And instead of the walnuts, we're gonna use cheese, and instead of the, um, what did I have over there? Okay, instead of the cake, we're gonna use chips. All right, so this is the higher fat product, this is the higher starch product, right? So what they did is they took uh, comparably hungry sixth graders and sat them down in a room where they could eat as much as they want of either cheese or chips. Now cheese is mostly fat, and has about 50% more calories than the chips, which are also fat, but you know, a lot of refined carbohydrate in there, okay? So by a calorie mentality, you would think comparably hungry children are going to eat you know, a similar quantity, but they're gonna eat many more calories of cheese because cheese is more caloric, I mean, uh, yeah, cheese, because cheese is more calorically dense. Do you think that they're going to gorge themselves and the cheese group is going to have more calories? Is that what happened? What happened? The chips group ate three times more calories. And that's consistent with meta analyses showing that kids have greater energy intake after eating a meal of like rapidly absorbable sugar. So it leads us to you know, two different ways of thinking about this mentality. So the predominant way of thinking about this is that obesity and diseases related to you know, increased adiposity or body fatness and the health consequences associated with it are a problem of eating too much and moving too little. And that the solution is that we should be choosing foods that have smaller portion sizes um, and um, you know, less calories within them, and that that will drive us to a place where we have decreasing obesity and decreasing problems. The alternative is that it's not the quantitative issue that's a problem primarily, but it's an issue of quality, and that certain food products are more problematic than others. And so particularly, it's the food, I don't know if this is an Apple Mac thing, maybe a Mac PC thing, so this isn't formatted quite right, but you get the basic idea and I'll make the slides available. Um, so particularly what I'm talking about are foods that are high in refined starches and simple sugars, the rapidly absorbable carbohydrates. So it's things like the white rice that we've talked about already, and the white bread, and the white pasta, and the white potatoes, particularly when they're processed and fried up into the chips we just saw on the last slide. And then you got you know the frankly sugary uh, treats like candy and ice cream and cakes and sugar sweetened beverages. And then you got all the less obvious stuff that the food in industry uh, engineers and injects with sugar without maybe even your knowing about it, like pasta sauces and breakfast cereals and yogurt and salad dressings, etc. etc. Right? That's Dan's yogurt. <laughs> <laughs> We got more of your yogurt coming. Wait for it. Um, so this could be the problem. So it's these foods, right, which, you know, as we consume them, may lead to resistance and hormones involved, involved in satiety and energy regulation. Right, so resistance in leptin, resistance in insulin, and what might be termed, you know, met obesity on a metabolic level. Right, so they drive us this way, and then that sends powerful um, messages to our guts and to our muscles to eat more and move less and to bring in more carbohydrates and create this feedback loop to kind of drive things this way, right? So that's the alternative way of thinking about this. Now, there is some overlap in these two ways of thinking about things. There's a calorie focused way of thinking about it and there's the you know, whole foods way of thinking about it. Um, the calorie focused way uh, so, you know, standard two-by-two two table, you guys have seen this in probably many studies, and if you haven't, get used to it, because it's like the most powerful thing in all of epidemiology. You can do a lot with a two-by-two two table. Um, so both ways of thinking about it would encourage, you know, healthy stuff, good, high-quality stuff. And that was the point of the JAMA piece that, you know, I think Dan might want to talk about later, 
but you know, people were randomized to high quality diets. I mean, high quality diets were generally high vegetables, legumes, you know, fresh fruit, um, uh, you know, whole grains, right? So healthy stuff. And I think they both would agree that sodas and sugar sweetened beverages and baked sweets and french fries and all that stuff is out, right? So that's the overlap. Now where they disagree though, is that calorie focused thinking would discourage you from eating things like nuts, like the uh, walnuts from the couple slides before, and avocados and olives and olive oil and whole dairy, like we talked about already, and fish, fatty fish. Uh, whereas it would encourage you to eat a lot of highly processed, refined foods like you know fruit juices and breakfast cereals and sugar-added yogurts and or, you know sweetened uh, not so great stuff. So what might that look like for a consumer? All right, so let's take I call this a tale of two salads. So we're going to start each of these salads with some green of your choice. I just use iceberg lettuce because that's what I can find a picture of. Or you could substitute arugula or kale or you know purslane or something like that. All right, so. So salad number one, we're going to add some white bread croutons. We're going to add some sugary fruit chew, craisins, if you will, although I don't like the recording, so I'm going to take that back. I retract that. <laughs> and um, some syrup, uh, syrupy fat free dressing. Uh, in salad number two, we're going to add some sunflower seeds, some avocado, and some olive oil. All right. So there is no question that the salad on the left is going to be lower in calories. It might have about half as many calories as the salad on the right. So this is higher calorie. There's also no question that this is full of like highly processed, refined, and largely artificial products, whereas this is real whole foods. It's largely whole foods. And olive oil is not a whole food, but it's you know not not highly refined either. Um, this is going to be less satiating. It's going to be less filling. It's going to keep you less full, whereas this is going to keep you more full. So this is going to provide less appetite control. This is better appetite control. And this is going to lead to more subsequent eating, or is this likely less so? So even though this index meal or index snack or index episode of eating has more calories, when you look at total calories for the day or the week, like this is going to sustain you longer and lead to less overall consumption. All right, back to Dan's yogurt. So how might the food industry respond to this? So we've got a sugar sweetened full fat yogurt. And this could be some generic yogurt. I know Dan puts like DV8 or some Star Wars character probiotics in it. I don't remember what it's called. Um, so we got sugar free. So we can adjust this in one of two ways. We can subtract out uh, the fat. So we can make a sugar sweetened non fat yogurt. Or we can subtract out the sugar and make an unsweetened full fat yogurt. Right? Now actually the directionality zero should go this way because this is really the whole food starting product and these are kind of reductionist modifications that the food industry does by you know injecting things with sugar and subtracting out fat. So this is unprocessed, processed, processed. But as with the slide, as with the other slide, this product, even though it's higher in calories, higher in fat, is likely to be more sustaining more appetite controlling and leads to better health outcomes than something like this, absent of fat and full of sugar, um, which is going to do kind of the opposite. Um, and just to support that, so this is some cohort data um, following two large cohorts over two decades. And basically it just shows the relationship of eating certain foods with increasing adiposity or, or obesity. Um, and um, so going in this direction means you know um, weight change over time in a direction of gaining weight. Going this direction means weight change over time in a direction of losing weight. And what I want you to note is that the high fat, high calorie foods listed here, like the cheese and the um, well, cheese and the uh, yogurt and the nuts, they are associated with change in a direction of reduced weight over time. Whereas the potato chips and the French fries and the you know sugar sweetened beverages and the um, and the desserts, right? Those are all headed, putting us in a direction of greater uh, a weight change in a in a positive meaning, putting on weight, not positive in a in the sense of being a good thing for us, right? All right. So then, so the question is for public health: Would the food choices that could result from a continued primary focus on calories be the best for individual weight and health? 
And this is my argument against the whole calorie labeling focus on calories to begin with. So you guys have seen this. So this is what nutrition facts label had looked like for years. This is the new nutrition facts label. And what you can see is they have made this the calorie information giant, right? Like literally everything else on this label. I mean, yes, there's now some greater attention to sugar and added sugars, which I think is good. But like literally all this other information is subordinated by this giant monstrosity that is calories, which gets people to focus, you know, most if not all of their attention on this one number. And really like health impact of a diet is not influenced by a single number focused on calories. And we've made this mistake before. So, um, you know, calories are essentially just another word for dietary fat. So again, calories, um, dietary fat has the highest caloric density of any of the foods. So when you are trying to reduce calories, you're often trying to reduce fat. And so fats and foods and fattier diets became the enemies of public health in the 80s and 90s. And even before, you know, so started, I think that was around the time when Sanford and Son was on, on the TVs that you guys can read about. Not in books, I guess, but in e-readers. Um, and so um, lower calorie products that were higher in sugars and higher in starches replaced the higher calorie products. And consumption shifted to carbohydrate, excuse me, carbohydrates, often the rapidly absorbable kind. And so people didn't eat less, they ate more, and they got fatter and sicker. And so not that that's causal, but, you know, these are, uh, this is just a plot. Uh, this, I think, is in men looking at uh, food consumption over time. So these X, this X line down here is fat intake. And so you can see from the 70s, you know, into the 2000s, fat intake went down. Okay? A little bit. You know, it's not a ton, but it went down. So it went from like 904 down to 859. Right? People started eating less fat. Calories were bad. Fat was bad. Just eating low fat, low calorie stuff. So they're going to reduce their caloric consumption by choosing less fat. Unfortunately, as we saw in the evidence that I showed earlier in the randomized trial and the experiment in kids, what happened was they replaced that fat with carbohydrates. So you see the carbohydrates actually went up. And it wasn't that they overall were eating less, they were overall eating more. So consumption went up in general. Right? So people were consuming more in general, and that's the point of all this. So I think that, um, so I think that this focus on calories is very misdirected and can lead people to undesirable health outcomes and even kind of the opposite of what we want to achieve. And so I'll conclude here. So take on points. The problem is not the sodium or the salt or the fat, even if it's saturated, or quantities of calories not otherwise specified. So I think we need to focus on food and overall diet quality, not food constituents. And we need to focus on patient-oriented outcomes, not surrogate measures. And we need to focus on facts, not alternative facts or alternative characters. And that is all. So, you know, um, the food that you surprised me, these food watchers have totally changed their diet. They're the early calorie counter. They, and now they make things like fish and chicken zero point. So people can eat as much as they want. I'm, I'm not as familiar with the Weight Watchers program. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I think everyone is coming to this realization. I mean, there's greater appreciation that it's about food quality. Um, you know, people will debate how much calories matter and what, you know, I mean, calories definitely count. There's no question about it. I'm not arguing that calories don't count. My point is that calories should not be counted, right? So we focusing on caloric quantity is what leads us to stress because it gets us focusing on the wrong thing. If we focus on food quality, we wind up having control of that caloric quantity automatically. It just happens. You choose better food, the food treats you better. So, so you touched on it with the better food than meat. Yeah. And really, so what are your feelings about organic food? Uh, well, that's a complicated issue, um, and so I think overall, again, organic production methods are desirable, um, and it would be great if they were more widespread. Um, there are different definitions of organic, um, and that's part of the problem. I mean, so there's certified organic, and then there are people that do even above and beyond what is considered organic, 
uh, without the label, and there are other practices that are officially considered to be within um, the what's acceptable for organic, but some farmers who have a higher standard question anyway. I, I, mean, I think in general, our food supply is uh, overly commoditized and we incentivize the growing and production and the production methods that are not so helpful and that we could return to more, um, you know, kind of more of our agrarian past. I think that would be a helpful thing. Not only for not only for our food consumption, but also for the planet, right? So you know, I mentioned before, like all this nesting, right? So it's not just the food cons components; it's the food. It's not just the food; it's the diet. It's not just the diet; it's the lifestyle. And it's not just the lifestyle; it's the person leading it in the family and in the community and on the planet that they live on, right? And so all of these things are interrelated, and we have to consider all these things. And a lot of the methods used for production these days are frankly quite problematic. Uh, not only in terms of the products they produce for our own health, but for the health of our planet. Uh, and that's a real concern. Yeah. Have you found similar research on like swapping sugar for artificial sweeteners? So, so there is a um, growing body of literature about artificial sweeteners, and the jury's kind of still out on that. Um, so, you know, from my perspective, I think we should get to a place where we're um, Want, you know, looking for that concentrated sweet taste less and trying to choose whole foods more. That said, as a stepping stone or an intermediate, particularly for people who are like, eating a lot of sugar now, I think artificial sweeteners can be a, um, a transition mechanism to get people towards healthier foods. Um, so there's some data to suggest that um, artificial sweeteners, you know, um, operate in the hypothalamus to like turn on the sweet signal that doesn't wind up being consonant with the uh, calories that are taken in so it creates this discrepancy and so what winds up happening is that people eat more later to compensate for the calories they didn't take in with the sugar load that the body thought they were getting um that said there's other you know data to support you know using it as a transition and a dietary tool so I actually was uh, fairly overweight myself in uh, fellowship. Uh, I put on a ton of weight my, when my wife got pregnant. And you know, there, was a, there was a picture of us leaning side by side. And we had like comparably big bellies. Um, and um, I actually used, I, I mean, I was um, someone who used diet beverages at that time to help lose weight, or it was a transition for me. Uh, now, in fact, I, I brought it with me. And so I, had, I don't want to use a brand name again. So I had a diet cola. Uh, and I brought the leftover case from fellowship to my job now, which is now like a decade ago. That, th those three cans are still there. Like I haven't touched them since. Um, so now it just disgusts me. Like it just, it just tastes artificial and synthetic and concocted. And, you know, the, um, a key point is that as you change your eating habits, like you re-equilibrate, you re-familiarize yourself and you, your tastes change. And so you start to love the food that's good for you, as opposed to the food that you know drives us towards it. Yeah. Um, so what can we say to underserved people living in these food deserts? It seems like to me that like focusing on the quality of food is almost like a privilege at some point. Do you think it's worth those people counting their calories, counting these individual levels? Because I mean, they're eating processed foods, they're eating junk food they don't, might not have access to this food quality. Is doing that better than nothing? Or do you think it could potentially be detrimental to continue that? Yeah, so I, I gave a talk earlier this morning touching on a lot of those issues. Um, and so, um, so I, I uh, practice in a, a, a very, um, uh, I'll say challenged and uh, in many ways disadvantaged, uh, lower income minority urban environment. Um, where there are those issues at play, certainly. Um, now that said, there is almost always sources of helpful food. And so it's just a matter of knowing where they are and how to access them. And then also what to do with them is another issue. Um, um, one problem in those communities, and this comes from research that I did during fellowship, is that there is a generational shift in food ways, such that the old heads and the you know, the, the grandparents and those of the earlier generation 
often came from the South, often came from farming traditions, often still garden themselves, grow their own food, have food knowledge, know how to prepare and cook it. In the younger generations, it's much more about convenience and time constraints, and there's much more reliance on highly processed, prepackaged, ready to go, fast foods and things. And so there's like an atrophy of those skills and what to do with it. Now, healthy food is not necessarily, I mean, yes, less available. It's not that it's not available, and it's not even that it's more expensive, but it is, it does often require more time and more preparation. So an example I gave uh, the talk last, uh, uh, earlier this morning, you know, I talked about like a bag of dried lentils. Like, so that's an incredibly healthy food, nutrient dense, uh, rich, um, you know, sustaining, filling, desirable, but it takes a long time to soak and cook. You have to know how to prepare it. And if you don't prepare it well, it's almost unpalatable, right? Especially the kids who are used to eating highly processed junk food. So these are complex issues. For my patients, I don't get into the, um, I, I tell them to choose food from plants. It's not plants. So plants, the living botanical kind, not plants, the industrial processing kind. And so the more that they can do that, the better. Um, if they can, you know, and if they have access to, you know, uh, organic products, um, that's great. And that's an extra plus, you know, I don't focus on that, but increasingly those are becoming more available and cheaper. So with like, you know, Amazon's acquisition of Whole Foods, um, you know, I didn't even buy, like, I mean, it's preposterously expensive, but now I go at like, I go into Whole Foods now and there's been like a real price decrease. And now Walmart is carrying organic products, Kmart, um, you know, and there's an increased demand. And I think, you know, through that, um, through these big corporations and through that, you know, kind of that shift in societal, societal expectation, um, that's going to become more of a reality even for those who are less privileged. And it, it may become more of the norm uh, and more of the default setting, which would be great. So, um, what? Well, we didn't have any final questions. So, we need to eliminate the book. What do your kids take for lunch? So, we'll be back for the lunch. That's fine. You read my general piece, right? Yeah, maybe a long time. Yeah, so I, I actually wrote a piece. Um, so I wrote a piece in my mind in JAMA a few years back because my kid was in uh, first grade. Um, and, um, you know, the, the impetus for writing the article was that I do send my kid to school um, with a packed lunch. And, um, you know, uh, he was getting, you know, food that we eat at home and food that he likes and food that were, you know, perennial favorites, and a lot of time that packed lunch was coming back mostly uneaten or, um, you know, in larger quantities than you would expect, and I'm like, what's going on here? Um, and so uh, the point of the article is just to point out that, you know, even in a privileged private school setting, there are lots of other sources of food out there beyond what's served in the lunchroom. Um, and so, you know, just for example, um, uh, there's snacks provided by the school, there's, uh, there's um, there's uh, uh, foods that are given during like aftercare or after school programs, during sporting events, for fundraisers. Uh, my kid had 20 kids in his class. Every kid had a birthday party. Every birthday party had, you know, cakes and cupcakes and whatever. Um, likewise, there were celebrations for every conceivable holiday you could imagine from, you know, Diwali to Chinese New Year to Valentine's Day to Halloween. So it was like just a constant stream of treats, which I argued weren't actually a treat because they weren't rare and, um, um, you know, special. They were a routine part of the diet. Um, but so that was a long way around just saying that even sending your kid to school with the best intentions and the best food and, you know, there are other influences, some of which are sanctioned and even provided by the school and then some are, you know, the peer group. Um, so what do I send my kid to school? So I, I pack as, I mean, usually it's, we bought Tupperware, so I send my Tupperware usually what's left over from dinner, a piece of fruit. Um, sometimes he gets like a granola bar or something like that if we can find any that don't have nuts. Don't even get me started on that. <laughs> that will go insane. Um, yeah, and I've written next things. You can Google my name and nuts, and I'm going crazy on that topic. Uh, nuts in school. But, um, um, so if I don't have nuts, sometimes I'll get seeds. So you can have seeds in the school or seed butters, like um, uh, like it's okay to send soy butter or like uh, sunflower butter. So we do that sometimes. Um, sometimes cut up vegetables. Uh, sometimes um, uh, there are these like slurpy things, which I don't love because there's a lot of waste, packaging waste, but they're like these, um, uh, they have like applesauce, but they also have like, uh, like fruit and vegetable mixes. So some are like, you know, 
apples and spinach and blueberries or whatever. But they don't complain their friends are eating Oreos. No, but some of their friends aren't. Um, but uh, and some of it, you know, he's kind of indifferent to. I, and you know, part of it is who your kid is and how confident they are and what the peer group is and how accepting it is and what the social circumstances are. But my kids never really had Oreos. You know, it's not. That's the thing. Like. Um, the whole concept of kids food, like a lot of parents tell me like, how do you, you know, God, your kid eats like, like he was three years old, we were at a sushi restaurant, he's eating like baby octopus. And all these other like parents were like mouth agape, like how is your kid eating that? It's like, cause he's never known anything else, you know, like um, he's never had a chicken tender or, you know, I wrote something about Kraft mac and cheese recently. Like, no, like just not like, um, um, and so he's never had it, and so he doesn't really want it, and oftentimes when he does have it, it doesn't taste good to him, because it's not familiar to him, and it's not consistent with the palate that he grew up with. Um, you know, it's not to say my kid never had junk, he totally does, I mean, absolutely. Um, but I think we're, uh, I think the food environment that we provide is qualitatively different than most of his peers. Um, and so, um, that's something that every parent has to wrestle with. But I mean, I think the whole concept of kids' food is just preposterous. Like kids should, I mean, just like, you know, people have made the analogy before to the animal kingdom, you know, like baby zebra eat what adult zebra eat, you know, <laughs> baby hippos eat what adult hippos eat, baby humans should eat what adult humans eat. And there's no reason that they have to have, you know, these, these ridiculous things that make it just a nightmare for parents to go out and for social situations and other things. So, um, um, that was a long answer to say yeah. my kid eats something different. Thank you so much for coming. Appreciate Thanks it. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, you guys are on break? <gasps> yeah, I get two straight breaks. Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> one, and then like one day off for each. Yeah, yeah. I get two spring breaks. You ejected? I ejected. Wait, did you, you record me? Was I in the frame? I wasn't even thinking when I stood up. Um, I don't know. I was supposed to get emailed. That's like.